Hello and welcome to all the men and women of the West. We're back with our Dragonlance podcast. With me is my co-host Stan, and we're going to continue from where we last left off with our exploration of Dragons of Autumn Twilight, or at least the ending of the book. I'm not trying to bash Michigal. It's just, this part is just so weird. And, of course, Caramon gets temporarily blinded and cries out for Tannis to help him, and not Raceland. Which, this is a marked contrast to the prequel books, and this just speaks to the tragedy of what happened post-test with Raceland, Caramon, and Parsali and whatnot. We've done enough videos and content on that. As to Sturm, he tries to do battle, but him and Tannis are basically magically beaten immediately. I have a problem with how Tannis is taken down. Okay, so Raceland's taken down physically, fine. Even though Raceland should have overpowered Verminar magically, fine. Caramon, I am really grudging because physically Caramon should have just schnook. <laughs> and Verminar, <laughs> Tannis has a magic sword that's built to fend off dragons. How is it some schmuck like Verminard can magically just go, Surrender! Okay. How the, what the, what, 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 what? Why even give him Worm Slayer if you're not even going to let him use it or if it doesn't even have any magic? It's like it's magical against Mataflow, but then it's not magical. I mean, this is a sword that was used to slay dragons and cut through some of their magic, I imagine. Like, at least let it cut through some of Verminard's spells. Let Tannis have one moment. Sorry, it's Tannis I'm actually angry about because Goldmoon's already had her great moment to slay a dragon. But does she have to have every combat moment? Part two, a lot of the story was about Tannis. The thing is, let's say Riverwind's gone and Goldmoon's not in there. I would have set aside Goldmoon to an extent in terms of the battle, and in book two or three, probably had her take down the Night Lord. The guy who's the necromancer perverting a lot of the creations and whatnot in Dragons of the Hourglass Mage, and in, I think, Spring Dawning. Have Goldmoon take him down! That would have been a great fight! That guy is way more powerful than Verminard. I want her to take down someone way more powerful than Verminard, but I want a character journey. Thing is, it's Tannis's moment to shine. Tannis has been the focus of part two so far with Lorana and Gelthanus and Qualanesti. So I kind of feel like it's got to be him who takes down the villain. So, okay, I, much as I'm like, yeah, but Tannis has to be the one to take this guy down. At no point does he get to shine. I mean, why is he even the leader then? Okay, he's led the team well in part one of this book, but in part two and three, he kind of screws up. Okay, fine. Let him get the shot on Ariakas. I don't mind the way Ariakas goes down. That's actually kind of funny. But Tannis needs at least to take down one dragon high lord because Tannis is the main character. Tannis getting to prove himself and show off his new sword. But then in book two and three, they do a great job of showing it but and i really like this the sword is not enough to take down cyan bloodbane for example so that in this book you build up the sword and you have everyone going wow that's that's basically the excalibur of the qualanesi cool then you see cyan bloodbane in book two and you go it doesn't auto win that's not good like tannis needed his death star trench moment get it here and i know i'm frustrated and whiny and ah I really like Tannis as a character, that's all. And I love him as a leader. I just... Oh, and he also took out Riverwind, now that I think about it. I forgot about that. And Riverwind is a pretty well-trained fighter, let's be honest. So he took out the two best. He took out Sturm with magic. He took out Riverwind, and then went to feed some. Goldmoon just waving at him and winking. You know what? Wait. Whenever there's a problem that the writers outsmart themselves, they always fall back on her. But they didn't outsmart themselves. Exactly. Verminard is someone who's vulnerable. His helmet is a problem. He can't properly see with this thing on. He fell from a bit of a height from his dragon, so he should be kind of going ow, ow, ow. Gold Moon does have potential as a character. Tannis is a great character. All the companions are generally great characters. These are just my frustrations with Dragons of Autumn Twilight. Generally, Winter Night and Spring Dawning, so good. They do the final battle thing a lot better. The final battle in Winter Night is one of the best fights ever. Spring Dawning, I will actually go to, to I will go on that hill and I will perish on that hill because Spring Dawning does a great job setting up the last fights. And you know why? It makes sense the way it goes down. I really like it. I really love the nod to episode six that Ways and Man do. It's just huge that I have a disagreement with them on. It's okay to be cool. I think they were kind of shying away from making Tannis too cool or Sturm or something. It's fine. Make them cool. They're trying to build up Goldmoon too much. I like Goldmoon. I do. Deep down, I actually like her character in hindsight. Much as I criticized her throughout the book, I've actually grown to like her on this read through. I want more and I want less from her in a way. The dragon fight is awesome. That I love. That oh, yeah. Although I, I really feel bad for Metaflow. Yeah, because... My children... 
Cause oh my gosh. I do admit on the three through part of me like, oh god, I'm getting a little choked up. Oh yeah, I got choked up. She's probably one of my favorite characters in this book. Yeah, she's so, she's like a granny. She was perfectly written. You want proof that Waste and Hickman are great writers and possibly the greatest living fantasy writers? Madafla. Just Madafla. A lot of my criticisms with Dragons of Autumn Twilight, it just lies in that, let's be honest, with the first time writing a novel. And look how great it is. 30 years later and we're still reading it and complaining about it and getting all heated about it. And people are going to criticize us in the comment section about it. This is proof of how great this book is. When Madafla becomes just a legend, some people swear they still hear... My children. Oh my gosh. That poor light. My head can. She spends the rest of her ten eternity spoiling and molly coddling her babies. And in time when certain children are grown up and pass away, they cross over and find her there and she molly coddles them too. And we have a wedding at the end, which now, as you know, we would have preferred Riverwind not to have survived. In place of the wedding, they could have had something like... I don't know, a conversion ceremony for Ellie's stand. But on the other hand, the Queshu tribe ritual marriage rite does have something interesting to it. They had to craft a gift for each other. Likely it would be probably something like a spun cloak on the woman's part and on the man's part, something like probably a brooch or a necklace. This is the sort of thing that I'm like, oh, that's an interesting piece of lore. It gives us insight into the Queshu people. But the rest of the marriage they decide to hold in the manner of the gods like Paladin and Mishkal. So that's basically a hybrid marriage, which, okay. Ellie Stan is sorrowful at this marriage. Why? Is he regretting that there were people who passed away? Shouldn't they be on he only be thinking about the marriage? Is he regretful that Goldmoon's marrying someone else other than him? Why is he regretting and sorrowful? And if he gets choked up about those who passed, make it clearer. Clarity can be helpful. But here, it's up for interpretation with Elliston. Like I said, ever since I was a kid, before I ever even touched Polish and Russian literature or Dickens or Victorian era literature, outside of Dracula and a few others, on page 433 of the paperback edition, N434, an interesting sermon from Milliston. I'm gonna stop bashing him for a minute just to acknowledge that it's pretty interesting. And apparently in the Paladinian belief system, the couple have to join their left hand with each other because the left hand is the hand of the heart, which sounds a little weird to me, but culturally Christianity is taught that is the wicked hand in a way, and the right hand is the hand of good. From a certain point of view, if you look at it from that point of view psychologically, essentially a couple are gonna see the worst of each other and they have to learn to love that part of the other person just as much as they have to learn to love the best part of each other. So I actually think this is an interesting idea in that the left hand being the hand of love, in a way, is an interesting concept. If you can love the worst aspects of another person's character or love them in spite of all their flaws, it's true love. And so I do see the wisdom. This is something I do agree with Ellie Stan on. And it's interesting that Corinne has these beliefs. Of course, we get an entire poem from Gold Moon and then Riverwind, which... Okay. No, it's fine. The poems, though, don't rhyme, sadly. And we get a ring exchange because we have to slip in real modernity into it and have an anachronistic scene. I thought the elves were the only ones with the ex ring exchange, but having the barbarians too and having everybody have. Apparently, Sturm notices Barum at the wedding reception and Sturm's a little suspicious going, wait, didn't he get crushed under a lot of boulders and stones and rocks? Hey, I have a chance. Uh, yeah. What the heck is he doing still breathing? And what the heck is that mouth breather still doing alive? Get back under the rubble. That said, we've covered the wedding, and next time we'll cover Raceland's warnings to Tannis. So if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to smash that like and that subscribe button as though you were Theros smashing a dragon lance into shape.